um, it's actually an evening here. It's 6 p.m. here, and uh, I will present you on a novel questionnaire based algorithm for predicting preeclampsia. Um, pregnancy itself is not a disease, but um, the demands of it may cause um, other metabolic or physiological changes, which may lead to poor health and then probably cause pregnancy related disorders. Now, preeclampsia has already been explained by most of the speakers, so I will not time my um, time on it. As it is known, the theology is still a problem. Um, however, current research actually explains that the placenta is the main underlying factor because removing of the placenta has only been the way to remit the condition. However, you know, we only remit um, deliver the placenta um, after the baby has de been delivered and that will be very late. Because of the condition and how its etiology has been a problem, it has been labeled as a disease of theory. Um, as currently it has been well explained, um, our basic measurement has been on proteins and uh, blood pressure. And to some extent, we also um, go in for this biochemical markers when uh, we actually realize that the person has developed the condition. But how do we tackle this? Um, looking at the lutein biomarkers, um, it's still been a problem because we are not able to identify the condition and advances in research are coming out with several biomarkers. Um, they are very sensitive. They can predict the onset of the condition. However, these biomarkers are not readily available and they are only used for research purposes. So the question I have been asking myself after my master's degree research um, on preeclampsia was, we have had a lot of biomarkers in place and we are trying to identify this condition. Um, but it's become a problem. Then it threw my, 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 my mind back to trying to understand what health is. Health is not just um, the absence of disease, but it explains the state of complete physical and mental social well-being. And so most of the time we actually focus more on the controls or the health and then the disease. And then we have neglected the suboptimal health, that is the state, that is the preclinical state of the condition. So thinking through my research and then my PhD research, um, I was looking at how we could be able to um, actually identify this condition using a very simple approach. Now to understand the preclinical state of a condition, I going through our research group and then the various research that has been conducted, I realized that um, by the leading of our um, scient uh, scientist or the professor or the supervisor, um, there has been a, a questionnaire that was developed to really assess the suboptimal health or the preclinical state of conditions. And that has been explained and been coined by this group of scientists um, who, Professor Wei Wang, who happens to be um, my supervisor, is the leading scientist. Now they develop a questionnaire based um, health screening measure. That is a suboptimal health questionnaire, uh, which is having about 25 um, items. Explains the perception of health, general weakness, chronic uh, fatigue, and low energy. And you realize that a lot of people will have suboptimal health. And that is the actual gap that we have actually left. So my project is actually a bigger um, scope, but I sat down and thinking through, I said, why not test this questionnaire in preeclampsia? Uh, 
um, sorry, my right. Okay. Okay. So the idea is to um, move from a delayed diagnosis. That is when we have to wait so the person comes to the hospital and then he's been diagnosed of preeclampsia. Then we say we are um, we starting um, treatment. And so looking at the questionnaire, I going through um, some publications, it has been recognized in precision medicine. That means it's, it's able to actually detect um, or uh, has been accepted as a concept of predictive, preventive, and personalized medicine. So it's a 25 base item questions that encompasses about five domains. This questionnaire has been um, really tested in about four major populations. And uh, the test reliability of this questionnaire is very, very high. So the previous cohorts on these four major populations are in African, Asia, Australia, and Croatians. So what is actually the interest here? Based on the previous research, I have found the link between cardiovascular risk and then the luteal dysfunction, which has been um, really associated with suboptimal health. And looking at this, it strikes my, my, my mind that since endothelial dysfunction is uh, one of the major hallmarks of preeclampsia, why not test this questionnaire? So it became a question to me. I mean, part of my research, it became a question to me from the very beginning. And so I decided to test the, this questionnaire for the first time to really see whether it will be very, very important to identify um, people who are at risk or pregnant women who are at risk of developing the condition. I further looked at whether the question has an association with um, objective biomarkers like um, oxidative stress and eugenic group mediators and other um, common biomarkers. And then try to look at a combined measurement of both the subjective and objective. Actually, it's the first time you have seen this questionnaire in pregnancy and to me, it will add more knowledge because it's, it's a low cost, less than a runtime, and it will be readily available to really identify risks of pregnant women who are uh, pregnant women who are at risk of preeclampsia. So we started a Ghana suboptimal health course study for a, a two-year period. Um, we initially recruited normotensive pregnant women, about 593, and followed them up um, after 21 weeks gestation, um, and then 32 to 42 weeks. Now, assessing the baseline data alone, we tried to actually use the questionnaire to um, really stratify stratify pregnant women who are clinically diagnosed as nomotensive or who do not show any signs of um, high blood pressure and protein in urine. And so just stratifying these two categories and this nomotensive pregnant women, we realize that about 50% of them are suboptimal uh, compared to about only 49.9. I mean, they are really comparable. And then the first study has found out that this suboptimal health pregnant women are really associated with imbalances in angiogenic growth factors and oxidative stress biomarkers. Then what really struck me was the relationship between the suboptimal health and then magnesium and um, albumin, magnesium and albumin adjusted calcium levels. And then Pregnant women who are not diagnosed as hypertensive, but are showing high levels of blood pressure. And so it's, it's, it was really interesting to see that. And that moved us to look at a follow-up study where we try to look at how this suboptimal health 
um, will be important in identifying this pregnant woman. So the follow-up was to integrate the suboptimal health as a criteria for um, preeclampsia. And out of the, um, the end of the study, um, there were lots to follow up. And then we realized that about 61.7% um, of the suboptimal health participants actually went on to develop preeclampsia. That, that is, this is really a huge um, number. Um, don't be so disturbed because I mean the initial sample size was very small. And so, um, going forward, we realized that using the questionnaire alone could be able to really identify um, about almost 90% um, of the participants being likely to develop preeclampsia. And then the discriminatory power, as I said, was about 0 0.89 um, um, area under the curve. And um, calcium and magnesium levels, when we looked at um, the suboptimal health who went to develop preeclampsia, they actually had low levels of magnesium and calcium at the very baseline of the study. So that led us to actually um, look at a combined measures of these three, a suboptimal health, the subjective and objective, that is, um, to be able to um, really um, come to a consensus and really understand health, we really need to actually assess both the objective and the subjective. And then putting these three um, um, factors or measures together, we realize that the algorithm is able to detect almost 80% of women who are clinically diagnosed as pneumotensive, but are likely or went on to develop preeclampsia. And so combining these measurements can predict about 80% of the cases. And looking at this, I can say that these measurements, that is magnesium, calcium, and these subjective measures are inexpensive. And that will be men, uh, much um, um, useful, um, especially in our settings. Um, the questionnaire, as I said, is the first time, or this algorithm that I've created is the first time being used. And then it um, needs further research. Um, I mean, other populations are supposed to actually look into this algorithm. And then as I was listening to a lot of the speakers, I think that we have actually not focused much on um, early assessment, um, encouraging early antenatal attendance, and then also looking into the nutritional aspect of pregnant women who comes. And um, I think um, routinely, maybe we could um, really start this calcium and magnesium um, supplementation early, and uh, maybe not to wait till they actually develop the condition. And so this, as part of my research, um, presented this algorithm in um, American Association of um, Clinical Chemistry last year, and it was awarded a Distinguished Abstract Award um, last year. And then from there, it has actually received several um, news mention in other publications and other radio interviews. So I would like to thank my collaborators and the uh, funding bodies um, for being, um, being part of this um, project. Um, thank you very much. Thank you uh, for your presentation. Um, Vivian, uh, my fellow moderator, is here now too, I think. Just to be a little bit, I want to invite Dr. Salisu Ishaku. Dr. Salisu, um, welcome. Um, the floor is yours. And we will have Q&A for both Enoch and Salisu after. 
Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Welcome. Can you, make can it you see full my screen? screen? We can see your screen. And if you make it a full screen, it's, yeah, perfect. The floor is yours. Welcome. All right. Um, thank you very much. And everyone who's here, just like anyone here, I'm also excited to be on this platform um, to look at issues around women's health, especially pre on this on this special day. And over the next 15 minutes or so, I will be looking at the life course theory in the prevention of morbidity and mortality from preeclampsia. And I'm going to use uh, and our experience from Nigeria with um, a postpartum follow-up study to illustrate what we'll be talking about. So this is my outline. I'll look at um, what life course um, theory is all about and as it relates to preeclampsia and how do our practice here in low and middle income country differ from um, people from high income country and then look at postpartum follow-up study in Nigeria to illustrate our argument and then give some summary and then end up with recommendation and conclusion. So as we know, uh, preeclampsia or uh, most of the hypertensive disorder pregnancy are newly onset hypertension, but preeclampsia is associated with biochemical and hematological abnormalities. Of course, preeclampsia is by far uh, the most uh, um, cause of death and mortality from hypertensive disorder and pregnancy. And we know that effective prevention, detection, and treatment of preeclampsia and complication actually requires a life course approach. Um, over the past few years, most of the effort have focused around antenatal care and interpartum care. Uh, we have not been able to put to uh, the desired attention um, during postpartum um, uh, period. So by way of, by briefly, let me say that life course theory of disease was initially developed to explain health outcomes as a product of overall life exposure, um, starting from in children life, early life experience, early childhood experience, adolescent, and even the adult life. That was how the theory was first um, developed. But um, over the years, it has been applied in virtually every aspect of uh, medicine, including reproductive health. In reproductive health, we look at, we refer to life course theory as care, for example, to cover preconceptional period, to cover antenatal period, intrapartum period, and then the postpartum period. So we borrow idea from this um, holistic approach to also apply it to prevention of mobility and mortality as a result of preeclampsia. And we believe that effective control of morbidity and mortality from preeclampsia pre can only be achieved if we apply the life course perspective to disease development. So I'm just using this um, global experience to further hi highlight why postpartum period should not be relegated to the background. Because right now, we are not really giving much attention to postpartum period. This is the data from United States Center for Disease Control and Prevention that was published in the middle of last year. And it shows that actually during postpartum period, one week after delivery up to one year, it accounts for 33% of why women actually die. But typically, we don't look at that. And when you look at um, the, the, um, why women that do delivery also, some of the causes are actually due to hypertensive disorder and pregnancy due to preeclampsia. So this is, uh, these are the reasons why women die as a result of, from that um, report. For example, overall, women die because of heart disease and stroke, and substantial part of this component is actually as a result of hypertensive disorder and pregnancy, especially preeclampsia. 
Um, in the week after delivery, women die from combination of severe bleeding, high blood pressure, and infection. So you can also see the role of hypertension in pregnancy in that segment of mortality. And one week after delivery, up to one year, the predominant cause of the maternal death are from cardiomyopathies. And again, a huge component of these cardiomyopathies are actually result from hypertensive disorder in pregnancy, especially preeclampsia. This is also another experience from Maternal Health Task Force, where they also emphasize the fact that postpartum period has not been given a prior or place in our attempt to prevent maternal mortality. Um, from the account, they believe that greater than 60% of maternal death actually occur during postpartum period. And it is believed that continuity of care from pregnancy through the postpartum period is essential for preventing maternal and newborn death, including those due to hypertensive disorder in pregnancy. So um, but now that we all know that postpartum period is an essential component of maternal health, what is the experience now between high income countries and low and um, middle income countries like Sub-Saharan Africa? We discovered that application of life cost theory to managing preeclampsia varies across this region. Most countries in um, high economies actually to some extent they have a dedicated guideline that include um, management of preeclampsia during postpartum period. We don't have those guidelines in our region. Uh, this is mainly because in the first place, we don't have our dedicated guidelines. What we do commonly, we use the World Health Organization guideline to um, manage our women. And unfortunately, again, the current WHO guideline for Preeclampsia management does not include postpartum period. And as a result of that, we don't give much attention to postpartum care needs of women when they develop preeclampsia after delivery. To illustrate what I'm talking about, I just um, want to share an experience from a study in Nigeria that we conducted from postpartum follow up of women with hypertensive disorder and pregnancy. And this study was conducted in eight tertiary hospitals, five of them are teaching hospitals. So we assume that care in these hospitals actually should be the best in theory, that if women go to this hospital, they are going to be, they will receive the best possible care available in Nigeria. That is theoretically, because these are teaching hospitals, these are tertiary referral hospitals. In that story, we recruited more than 400 women with, um, um, hypertension and pregnancy, and wanted to determine what is the degree of adherence or compliance to international guidelines as it relates to postpartum management of women with preeclampsia. And we also want to determine prevalence of persistent physiological derangement, something like persistent hypertension, issues like um, some metabolic problems, and see whether truly this woman continue to exhibit complication of pregnancy during postpartum period. These were the two main objectives. This is just to tell you the data um, collection process from the baseline at delivery. We look at this woman at nine weeks, at six months, and then finally at one year. And during this period, we collected information, both clinical and laboratory um, information. So this is one of the things we're talking about. When you look at this um, bar chart, it just shows us that these are women with hypertensive disorder and pregnancy whose blood pressure were measured and documented in the first five days of delivery. When you look at it, on the first and second day, more than 80% continue to get their blood pressure measured and documented. But after the second day, the proportion of women that receive these services dropped drastically so that by the fifth day of delivery, more than 60% actually were not um, their blood pressure was not measured. That is just to illustrate how um, careless we are generally in this part of the world in terms of managing women after delivery. We do everything during the period, 
we do our best during delivery and after delivery, we seem to relax our care uh, for this woman. So this is one example. And this woman, we are not, the, their blood pressure was not measured because they were normal. No, blood pressure in this woman continue to be high, as you can see from this slide. Um, when we look at, for example, preeclampsia, women with preeclampsia continue to have high blood pressure at six months, at nine weeks, and even up to one year. But nobody is checking their blood pressure. So this is really a concern um, in the way we manage women with hypertensive disorder and pregnancy. Not only preeclampsia, also chronic hypertension, restrictional hypertension, and those with um, eclampsia. And these are the proportion of women with moderate to severe hypertension. In the first one week of delivery, who should have been on antihypertensive, but who are actually on antihypertensive? So when you look at it, when you look at, for example, women with eclampsia and preeclampsia, over 60% of them, over 40%, um, actually, we are not on antihypertensive, and they should be on antihypertensive. And this is only the first week of delivery. So by the time you look at what happened to them in the second week and third week, you discover that the coverage will certainly become worse than what we see in the first week. And these are other aspects of quality of care that we also, we also look at. For example, um, we look at if women, um, if their babies receive neonatal care after delivery, because it's part of the component of care for this woman. And you can see that um, only like 55% actually go that care. And when you look at it, it's the same for all uh, other uh, indicators that we have measured. And it's even worse for women with preeclampsia who actually remain hypertensive after two weeks who should have been given medical review according to most guidelines, but only 20% in our study received this care. And we felt that this is really, really very bad because we are taking off um, women who are receiving care at the highest level of care in the country. This is the same um, information from what I spoke the other time, but in a different way. So I will just um, skip over it. And this is also, we look at um, women who continue to have um, risk factor for future uh, cardiovascular health, for future endocrine problem like diabetes mellitus. And we see that lots of these women actually exhibit high percentage of these women continue to show evidence that they are actually at risk of those future um, health status. Mm -hmm. um, they remember protonoic at one year, BMI was generally high after one year, high level of cholesterol, triglyceride, and other biochemical indicators. So this means that one, risk factors are high in our women. Our women continue to have um, physiological derangement, but yet we are not doing anything about their condition once they deliver. Um, because to also show you that, um, to demonstrate the fact that Postpartum care generally is not given a pride of place. Information on how women were managed during postpartum care, especially when they have preeclampsia, is generally scarce in this region. Nobody is doing anything about it. We didn't get any information in Southern Africa and Southern Asia. But uh, we lay our hand on a program report from Bangladesh by Sharif Mohammed and his colleague, where he also documented um, their experience on the quality of care that women receive after delivery. And most of their finding are actually exactly to our finding in Nigeria. And we believe that that would be the situation in many countries in Southern Africa and South, Southern Asia. But whether we have information from there or not, there is a WHO systematic review that actually indicated that in general, there is inequality in the coverage of postpartum care between high income countries and low and middle income countries. And this is enough to tell us that the um, laxity in care in our region is actually a fundamental problem that we must look at. So um, in summary, um, uh, we should uh, know that there is huge inequality in the provision and access to postpartum care among, our, among global economic blocks, and especially for women with hypertensive disorder, in pregnancy, um, 
women in high income economies are actually seem to be getting the care, not optimal, but they are getting some kind of care, while we do not get that kind of care in our setting. And because of poor perspective of surveillance in our region, health outcome for these women are actually in unknown are, are not are undocumented. So we will not be able to say anything about it because we don't document them, we don't know what is happening to them. And this inability, inability to care for these women during the postpartum period will certainly jeopardize their future pregnancy outcome and also other health outcomes. So we need to do something about that. And preventing mobility and mortality from preeclampsia can only be successful if women are attended to holistically, right from preconception period, antepartum period, intrapartum, and postpartum period. So maybe to develop on what Emmanuel just presented that in Ghana, they are thinking of um, having eclampsia matrix to, to their practice. Maybe you should also um, put more effort in seeing that every woman that develops hypertensive disorder pregnancy must be tracked during the period until everything becomes normal or until she is referred to um, family care or other specialist care. Because these women go out of this, our care and we don't know what happened to them, and they are undocumented, and we cannot account for their health um, status. So, um, so I have these four recommendations. One is that we recommend that Ministry of Health, especially in our region, should be supported to develop dedicated guidelines for women with preeclampsia during postpartum period. And after that, there must be, um, um, in addition to postpartum care, women with preeclampsia should be advised to receive preconceptional care in order to recover, um, to receive the, um, the entire care along the entire maternity spectrum. And this guideline, once developed, should be followed with a tailored on the job training and mentorship for frontline healthcare providers. And finally, we must to continue to rigorously um, evaluate the benefit of these guidelines and appraise them uh, on, on one basis to be sure that the guidelines are actually delivering what they're intended to do. Or if we need modification, we can actually modify these guidelines. Um, thank you for listening, and I will be happy to answer any question from this presentation in due course. Thank you. Thank you very much, Doc. It's been a good presentation. So we will now open up for questions from the two presentations we've had so far, from Enoch's presentation and from Dr. Salisu's presentation. We have one from Nana Ampofo, who would want to know how long you suggest the postpartum tracking of a patient should be. Dr. Salisu, could you help us with that? Yes, um, thank you very much. And traditionally, we, we assume that after the papyrium, papyrium means that uh, a period from delivery until 68 weeks, that most of this biological management will actually went off. The woman will be normalized after 68 weeks. But um, in reality, these conditions are not going to go away, especially hypertension may not realistically disappear in all women until at least uh, three months. But that should not be our yardstick. The yardstick is that for every woman, she must be continue to be monitored until all these symptoms and sign disappears. Exactly. And if after two, two months, there is no improvement in their disappearance, then women should prefer to specialist, dedicated specialist unit for further management. The certainly some of these women will receive life and care. You have to remember that. Okay, thank you very much, Doc. Do we have any more questions? So, Evelyn. Can we hear your que the question from Evelyn? Hello, Evelyn. Yeah, hello. Um, thank you very much. Um, Dr. Salisu, 
Um, the question I like to ask is, what um what measures are you putting in place to track women who refuse to come back for aftercare services? Because in Africa, a mom in Ghana, some of the women will not come back to the hospital after delivery. And so what are you doing to track them? Because if they are not coming, you also can give them the care. So what do you think can be done to encourage women to come back for the postpartum care period? Uh, thank you, Evelyn, for your question. I think what we observe is that we also don't counsel them and let them understand the implication of their health and what they need to do. We don't do that. In my presentation, I did not give many uh, information because for lack of time, but if I had, had the opportunity, you can see that when we try to find out whether women were counseled uh, in terms of their future health, in terms of their the risk of occurrence in the future pregnancy, in terms of whether they should use contraception or they should control their body weight, we discover that more than 80% of women were not given that information. So truly, if we counsel women, no woman want to die. If we counsel her, <laughs> give her enough time that um, this is, is something that she can actually lead in her own care and she can do it on her own way with the support of the health system, most of them will actually comply. So we are not given the counseling. Okay. Of course, no woman wants to die. Not when you are given life, you are given birth. I mean, you are carrying a new life. Nobody would want to die. Thank you on that point, Dr. Salisu. Karen wants to find out whether you have considered using mobile health apps, mobile phones, apps on health on mobile phones to track and follow your women. Uh, no, but um, women in this research, for the purpose of this research, yes, we actually um, use um, mobile phone, and that really actually increase our follow-up rate because we have a follow-up rate of up to one year of a seventy percent. For a cost study to have a seventy percent follow-up in Southern Africa, you know that we really um, it did very well, and part of that success was as a result of that mobile tracking. Okay, so then we, are, we, are, we agree that using a mobile phone app could also help track these women, especially when they realize their BPs are raised and then we, they could be followed and encouraged to come back to the health facilities. From Hafiz Muntala, Hafiz would like to know If any attempts so far have been made to get the suboptimal health model of Dr. Odame integrated into our matern maternal health services. I'm not sure whether Dr. Salisu could answer this. Dr. Enoch may probably. Yeah, hello. Um, as I said, um, it's, it's a new um, questionnaire used in, um, for the first time in pregnancy. Um, currently, uh, what we've been able to generate is um, a QR code that once um, you are you're able to scan the QR code, you'll be able to, um, the questionnaire can easily be available to you on your mobile phones. Um, that is how far we've gone now, um, but has not yet been um, actually included in our hearts. It has been a current discussion um, in the school and currently um, the suboptimal health um, integration into clinical um, health research has been one of the major um, um, research area that has been accepted, accepted by the Edith Cowan University. And uh, we are trying to liaise with um, other health professionals here but I think in the Ghanaian settings, um, because it's a first time, I don't think it has been um, used. And I, I, it's, it hasn't been used anyway. Maybe, yeah. Let me, maybe. Sorry, sorry. maybe for those, if I can add something, for those who are interested in prediction models um, and the integration in clinical care, mm -hmm. I in the chat, I listed a uh, two systematic reviews that have been recently conducted. Um, that lists all the available prediction models. Um, most are too early to implement because they have not been externally validated, meaning that they have not been assessed for how well they perform 
in different settings from where they were developed. And that's a crucial step before, before implementation. And then when it's implemented, those need to be evaluated for its effectiveness. Um, and in the systematic, the second systematic review, um, this is also extensively discussed. So there are a few very interesting resources if you're interested in this topic. In addition, Dr. Von Safo would like to make a comment. Yeah, thank you. We can get his comment and then we could. Thank you, Vivian, for the opportunity to uh, make a comment. First of all, I want to take the opportunity to say thank you to the organizers and the invitation and also um, to invite all of us to kind of be part of it. I think the um, first, secondly, I want to congratulate uh, the presenters for a very good um, work done. Um, I was going to talk about the comments that uh, Joyce made. This um, innovation by Dr. Anto is very good, just that, as she said, we need to kind of um, validate it internally and externally and assess the impact and then when it is finally um, agreed that externally is performing well, it could be integrated. So it's a good innovation, which um, we have to kind of um, congratulate him for doing, and then we may be able to integrate that into our work, I mean, in future, and then the Ghana Health Service, I'm sure will be very um, happy to kind of welcome it, I mean, to the management um, protocol. The other thing I want to talk about, I mean, to add to, um, Dr. Salisu's um, presentation is that we know that pregnancy um, and uh, preeclampsia actually is uh, the cardiovascular um, effect. I mean, can occur days and years. And so we should not really think that after delivery, we need to just um, monitor them for six weeks and leave them. Even after one year, these women actually, they may have had endothelial dysfunction that kind of may predispose them to um, development of some cardiovascular disease in future. And we should continue to um, look at that. We are happy to see the work of um, Salisu because it's an area that people have actually neglected. Obstetricians, after delivery, they think they are done. No, you are not done. We need to follow up. We think once we are able to deliver a healthy mother and a healthy um, a baby, we are done. We need to look at some of these things and then move on. Lastly, um, Dr. Anto, you were surprised to see that there was a lot of uh, this endothelial dysfunction in um, uh, women, even though those who were just pregnant and had not developed um, preeclampsia. It's, it's something that um, we have also found out, especially when we did study vascular endothelial dysfunction by measuring um, nitric oxide levels and um, vascular endothelial growth factor levels. They were evidence that actually comparing those who are just pregnant, they have some form of um, dysfunction. And it was significant when compared to non-pregnant women. However, it was far higher when you compare to people who had developed a pre -eclampsia. So these are things that we should be looking out for. And in future, I hope we'll be able to work hard and be able to and improve maternal health for women who develop hypertension in pregnancy. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Doc. We would pick one last question. Um, Dr. Sally so, so a participant wants to find out whether there is a roping program for husbands, especially husbands in the Sub-Saharan Africa because he thinks getting husbands in would help achieve more maternal health, like a better maternal health care for women. What do you have to say on that? Yes, again, thank you very much. But uh, we also know that this is a research, it's not a program per se, but um, using husband in Nigeria has widely been um, utilized in family planning but it hasn't been done, um, it, it hasn't been employed in other areas of, of maternal health. But even in this study, actually, we actually enrolled a woman and then used her own mobile contact as the primary um, means of um, contacting her. And then secondly, too, we collected the husband number. And personally, myself, I think I have reached out to many women 
at least 15 women through their husbands. So yes, I agree with that. that certainly, um, men are actually important collaborator in this um, effort. And certainly, men's involvement is always a key component of what we should be doing in Sub-Saharan Africa. Okay. Joyce? Okay, so thank you. Um, so with this, we would like to conclude this part of the, um, the program.